Hello guys and welcome to this very hot day in LA. Um, I have the fan behind me because there is no doing without it right now. Um, okay, so we are going to start a series that um, is inspired by the book uh, Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. If you haven't read it, this is my copy. It's a very old copy. Um, I've had it since I was like 15, literally 15. Um, if you haven't read it, it, it is a very good read. It's kind of a day-by-day -day devotional on the question, what uh, on earth are we here for? Why were we created? Um, and this is a question that I mean, all of humanity asks itself, like, what is the purpose on this life, um, on this earth? Um, why, why do I exist, right? And so we're gonna go, um, close to the themes and the and the topics of each day but it's not going to be like a verbatim we're going through the book as we're studying kind of thing it uses similar you know the same verses it uses um the same kind of thought process um however um it obviously has a lot of my flavor so um so we're gonna we're gonna do that and hopefully god could speak to us through um through this day by day kind of going through it. So our first day, um, it's called, the topic for that day is, is called, it all starts with God, right? Um, and so we start there um, by, uh, there's an author, an atheist, his name is Bertrand Russell, and he said, unless you assume a God, the question of life's purpose is meaningless. Basically to say that in a world of you know, natural selection in the world of uh, survival of the fittest. The notion of purpose is unnecessary, right? We were, uh, we evolved into the species. We live to survive, you know, everything that we do, whether it's our connections to other people, um, the good that we do in the world, it's basically just for our benefit, for the continuing of our species. And so purpose, there's, there's really, that's extra. There's no point in that, right? And um, as a Christian, we believe, well, because we have a creator, there is a purpose. A creator creates with intention. And we very, very much believe that that is our God. He is, he is one who created us with a purpose in mind. So um, to answer those questions, humans just in general, we default into focusing to a self-centered kind of focus, right? Um, well, what should I do with my life? You know, what, what are my dreams and goals? Let me, let me look inside. Um, how should I shape my future, right? It's really just all about the self. And so um, we have tons of self-help books and personality tests that tell us what we're good at and to tell us that, well, you know, find what you're good at, dedicate yourself to your passions, um, and, and serve the world with your gifts, you know, for the betterment of mankind. Um, and, and that's not, not bad. That's, obviously, those are all noble intentions. However, um, to say that that's the final say is kind of short in its future vision kind of thing. It, it's, it cuts short of what truly is intended for humans. Um, the, we, we're going to go through a selection of verses. Um, and as we read these verses, I will throw out a little bit of context of where those verses are found. Because when, and, and you know this, in modern day media, you take any phrase or any saying out of context, and you're like, he said what? Right? Like, it's scandalous, because you've taken it out of the cocoon of meaning and just inserted it to say whatever you want to say. So, um, as we will see, the context of where a verse in the Bible finds itself will lend itself to providing a much richer meaning, a much richer understanding of what that text is actually saying. So uh, first verse is Colossians 1.16. It says, um, oh, the context of this particular verse, um, the author is the writer speaking about the supremacy of God, the supremacy specifically of the Son of God, which is Jesus, right? So the verse says, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers, 
or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him for. So considering its context, right? It, it, the verse itself is talking about how all things that exist, everything that you can see, everything around you, um, all the science, all the, the setups, you know, all of, all of that was created by someone, by a, by a creator. And so these were created through him, for him. Um, you know, scientists sometimes, they, they look through science and they, they, they go, oh, you know, this is how it all came about. Um, this is why we're here, you know. We try to explain our existence by, by the way the universe works. And this verse, what it's saying is, look, even science, all things, all things, every, every system, every way that it works um, was created by him through, through him for him, right? So the purpose of creation was for him. Now, again, context, who's him? We can say, oh, well, it's God, you know, which is true. Um, but specifically, this context, it's making a bigger claim. It's claiming that the Son of God, which is God manifested in the flesh, Jesus Christ, um, is God himself. And so all things that we see were created by Jesus, through Jesus, for Jesus. And so in answering that question, you know, what, what am I here for? What on earth was I created for? Um, this is one way that the scripture answers that question. We were created for Jesus, for God, you know, Jesus being God. Um, so some people use God as a means of self-actualization, right? Well, Jesus, God, he has to help me in this, you know? I put my mind, these are my goals, and, and you know, God help us. <laughs> God, you know, make these plans successful when it's actually the opposite, right? We were created for him. So we should be coming to the son of God saying, what are your plans for me? What are the goals and the dreams that you have that you want me to accomplish um, for you, for your glory, right? It, the focus shifts from us and what we want to do and our desires um, to a, a Christ-centric focus. And next week, we're going to talk a little bit more on, you know, how we, in, in our awesome uniqueness, how we fit into that plan. Um, because that also plays a role, you know, it's not completely dismissing who you are, just, you know, submit like a zombie, it's nothing like that. We were created with so much diversity that um, that was included in the creation process, in the purposeness, purposefulness, <laughs> I am messing up here, but um, that was included in the thought process when we were created. So that's nothing to just throw out the window, you know. It's not, uh, what's the phrase? You, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, we're not throwing out the fact that we are unique individuals. What we're saying here, though, is that when we first focus on purpose, we must focus on God. As the chapter uh, or the day devotion uh, states, it all starts with God. And this verse is saying it all starts with God. It all started with God, but it is eventually all for him. And then we can draw the conclusion, well, then if it's for him, then it all ends in him too. Um, and there's plenty of verses that support that. So um, now we go into the book of Job. Now, just to give you kind of a context of the book of Job, um, Job is a righteous man um, that goes through a lot of trouble, goes through, I mean, some would see his plight and go, you know, that was just unfair. You know, that was like what he went through. You know, he, he was doing things right. He was doing things the way that God commanded. And yet he lost his home, his family, his wealth, you know, everything that he had going for him, he lost. And, um, and his friends around him were telling him, like, you must have done something wrong. Like, this doesn't just happen just because, you know. Um, and so there comes a point where Job's like, you know what? I'm a righteous man. I'm a, I'm a good guy. Let me uh, present my complaint to God himself. And, and he's going to make it right. 
he's gonna make it right. Like no questions about it. He was so sure about himself. And um, and in the end, God takes that, even that as a challenge, um, as to say, look, I'm God. I created everything. Where were you when I when I set out the ocean? Where were you when I hung up the stars? You know, he just goes on. He berates him like he just like you know puts him in his place, right? Check mode kind of thing. But he basically tells him, "Who are you to say I'll present my case before him and I win?" Like God will be um, the one who satisfies all of these questions and and all of these you know inquiries that we have in the end god is god and he can do whatever the heck he wants you know and as contrary as that sounds to our american mindset of like that's rude right but the fact is um there is a god in heaven and he is in control and there comes a point where we must in humility as the creation say well he's god and i'm not and i will do what he has commanded. I do what know, do what I know is right. Uh, but in the end, he's God. And the crazy thing, though, about in the even in the midst of all of this craziness that Job is going through, um, even in his "I'm right," and God, you know, didn't even like that attitude. He still finds a place, though, Job, to say to recognize. Look. Uh, Job 12 10 it says in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind right it's a rhetorical question the, que the answer to that question is well it's God and so as humans we're right on track sometimes and then we get off track and then we come back on and we're so flimsy and God's like I'm eternal I'm forever here and so kind of to say look even if let's say we are in the right as in our mind we understand it to be um god is still creator overall he's still in control of it all so if he chooses that your life goes this way you know oh but you know that's not where my my talents and my um my uh, that's not where i should be and, and in the end, we have to, like in the end, Job did, um, find a place of humility and say, no, well, you know, you're right. You're God and you know best more than I could ever know. Um, and so that's the beauty of it. Like Job found that, yes, his purpose is to live for God, whether or not we could justify that in our own brain or not. There's major humility and submission going on there. Again, something that our American mind goes, no, you know, fight against the power, you know, and justice and all that. But in the end, you know, God is God, right? And he is creator of all. Um, let's move on from there. I mean, there's be plenty to be said about the topic, but Romans uh, 8, 6. Um, this particular section, uh, the writer of Romans is uh, talking about how for those who believe, for those who believe in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation, right? There is forgiveness of sins. Um, there is a righteousness that is imputed upon us. And so um, from there we pick up. And so he says, Romans 8, 6, for the mind set on the flesh, right? The things of this world, the, the things that your body wants, the things that, um, that are just material, right? Um, for the mindset on the things on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life, peace. And so the worldly material-like matters, right? The, even the personal matters even, um, especially when questioning our purpose, our wisdom isn't enough, right? And so um, the world says, be successful right? And, and that's your goal, right? You set your goals, you find success, and, and you love what you do, and that is finding your purpose in life. And so this verse reminds us that, in fact, that might not be the case, you know? Um, there might be things that a deviant enjoys doing, and well, I'll just create it this way. But in the end, 
we must ask ourselves, okay, well, we have the word of God, the word of God um, given to us. If what I want contradicts that word, then what I want has to find a way to align itself for what God created me for in actuality, right? Um, I won't go too much into that side road, but does that make sense, right? The, the fact that when our mind is on the spiritual, then our desires will end up aligning with that, will end up following that, not the other way around, right? Well, I, I feel this way that therefore it must be this way. Our feelings are fleeting, we're human, we're changing constantly. And God being God, eternal and immutable, right? That means he, he doesn't change. He is God. Um, wouldn't he know best? Wouldn't he know what we were created for and what might be best for us in the end, whether we can't see it right now? Just like when a kid wants that extra cookie when he's already eight, five, and the mom's like, no not good for you we don't you, you no more cookie right and the kid no matter how much you explain it, let's say he's a, a two-year-old right a toddler can't understand yet the whole concept of eating so much junk food will end up harming your body will end up giving you a tummy ache in, in the short run in the long run give you health uh problems or you know, there's bigger matters at stake but the kid's just like no no this is what i want this is what i feel and so sometimes adult humans are like that we put our mind on what we want and no that's what i feel and this is right when god's like look i see the bigger picture can you trust me to know better i mean i, I can't explain it any better than that and so um keep that in mind as you contemplate your uh my purpose right your purpose uh contemplate on the fact that you know when we set our mind our, on things of the spirit and continue to do that in effort, right? This is a this is a effort, a, a thing that you have to strive for. Um, that your mind may align, mind may align to that which God wants in your life, right? Whether or not it agrees to your fleshly, sensual, you know, uh, materialistic, immediate desire. There's that in Romans. Um, and so, uh, oh, the one thing I was going to mention about success, the world says be successful. And the word of God doesn't necessarily agree that being successful is fulfilling your purpose, right? It, it doesn't always equate. Sometimes failure is what God takes us through in order to teach us how to be more like him and to be more like what he created us to be with the purpose that he intended in his mind you know um and so we learn there that success is not the same thing as fulfilling our purpose um i'm gonna say something more about that but i kind of um uh, flew away um so let's move on matthew 16 25 um this particular verse um Oh, one of my favorites. Okay, so in Matthew, uh, Jesus is speaking to the crowd, and then he goes through, um, we're in Matthew 16, so if you want to go back and read it so you can see what I'm talking about, he goes through a spiel in this particular chapter, um, uh, various different things, but the ones that will focus in succession, he starts off by talking about um, beware the leaven of the religious folk. Of, of the, the Sadducees. And so the leaven being their sin, their sin in reference specifically to their pride, their puffed up attitude, their, um, they, they, they would, I'm going to put in a little plug here. Um, if you've ever watched The Chosen, uh, which is an amazing rendition of the ministry of Jesus Christ. I mean, I know we've been traumatized by a lot of bad, um, <laughs> a lot of bad TV on the depiction of, of Jesus' life, but this one is so amazing. I mean, and you see these Pharisees and these Sadducees walking around with this 
conceit and this puffed up arrogance, right? And so it, it, it brings them to life where you're just like, oh, I just want to put them in the face, you know? So here, this is what Jesus is talking about when he goes, beware the leaven of the uh, religious uh, people. So he's saying, beware of walking around with this arrogance, right? This puffed up attitude. So that's one section. And then it moves on to where Jesus asks the disciples, okay, who do you think I am? And so Peter confesses um, or reveals right um, here that, oh, you are the Christ. You are the son of God. And so everybody's like, yeah, Peter, right? And then uh, Jesus goes on to talk about his coming death, right, as prophesied. And then Peter's like, no, Jesus, don't do that, right? He comes up to Jesus like he knows it all. And um, in complete self-importance, and that's when Jesus turns around after just having praised him and like, you know, punches him in the face and goes, get away from me, Satan. Like what? And so here, taken into context, um, we can see this, this thread of this self-importance, self-wisdom kind of thing. Like I know best kind of thing. So let's read the verse and then we'll come back to this. Um, it says, Matthew 16, 25. Then Jesus said to the disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, we have heard this verse countless times, right? And we go, oh, yeah, 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 right. That means, you know, I should be wary of my time and not waste it and focus on godly things and, you know, follow Christ. And I shouldn't watch so much Netflix. And, you know, I, I got to cut down on those video games, right? Um, we've heard this verse so many times. But taken within context, it just adds another layer of self-denial that, I mean, when, when I connected it, I was, it right, blew my mind. So here, um, again, it's talking about beware of the self-importance that some humans walk around with, right? Um, and so then, you know, we see that in the example of the, the religious folk, we see that in the example of uh, Peter's, you know, self-important thoughts. No, God forbid that you do such a thing. And Jesus is like, I do my own thing. But like, what, what? Get away from me. Like, this is the plan. Not what you think, but what God commands. And so when finally he gets to this, deny yourself and follow me, he's referencing this, deny yourself and what you think yourself to be, you know, with, with your big lofty thoughts and your your, the Bible says um, that our thoughts are not God's thoughts. You know, our ways are not his ways. His ways are much higher than ours. And so when we walk around with this, I know best, you know, let me tell you how to live your life or, you know, I'll live my life as I please kind of thing. Um, God's like, that's not what I want for you. It starts with me. It started with me. It ends with me. That means the middle is also me. And so the focus, again, Going back to the same thing, it is, it's not yourself. It's not what you want. It's what God wants, right? So when we come to God in that, again, that humility and say, God, what do you want for my life? How do you want me to live my life? We trust in God that we will be happy. It's not this like, oh, this martyrdom, like, ah, oh, just, you know, splash, splash, you know, tear your back out. And, you know, I must live in, in this self demeaning, deprecating kind of, no, it's, it's beauty because it is the reason we were created. I mean, I, I think it's beautiful. Um, so Jesus is rebuking that attitude of self-importance, that earthly wisdom, wisdom that comes from God. And the wisdom that he has shared with us then is what we should be focusing on. That was the flipped around sentence, but you get it. Um, all right, so moving on. First Corinthians 2. Six through seven. Um, in this particular passage, Jesus is sorry, not Jesus. The the writer here, Corinthians, um, he's speaking about the gospel plan towards all who believe. So now we're going into okay, purposes, plan. What was the plan in the first place, right? And so we're gonna break down something really beautiful here. So get ready, uh, snap in. Um, he goes, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, right? So Basically, if you are mature enough to understand this, listen up. We're talking a message of wisdom. But not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, right? Um, we mentioned self-help books. 
and and personality tests. I have taken so many personality tests. You take the test once and it says tells you that you're one thing and you take the test again and something completely different. You're like, whoa, okay, what am I this or that? Like what I've been told that I'm, you know, all sanguine and just a little phlegmatic and then some come out to be completely phlegmatic. You have no idea what I'm talking about. I mean, if you do, you it, 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 it was a personality test and now oh no no that's wrong it's something different right the, the, the wise the wisdom has progressed and so and now it's um oh God, i don't even know how to pronounce it that that i'm not even gonna try it, there's just so many personality tests out there and sometimes it contradicts and you know sometimes the self-help books tell you to do one thing and then like new psychology comes out and you're like oh that was totally wrong i don't know where they got that from now it's this like this is what this is talking about. This is the craziness that it's talking about. That the wisdom of this age, it comes to not, right? It changes as easy as the wind blows direction. So that's, that's not the kind of wisdom I'm talking about. Verse seven, no, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. I think there's something so special in this verse. It talks about God's wisdom, which we'll talk about in the next, little passage of scripture that we're going to read so don't worry about too much about that yet um it talks about this mystery that's been hidden again we're going to talk about a little bit more of that and then he goes but all of this that god has destined for our glory before time began okay so god is all-knowing he knows the end at the beginning um but all of this the way he created us the time and place he has placed us the the everything around us this plan this mystery for our glory a lot of the times as christians you shun this like no no the glory all be to god and which is totally 100 percent true but here the author allows himself to express god's plans for our lives as a sort of glory, right? Why wouldn't our life lived in God's plan, lived in his purposes, in that beautiful mystery that he's revealed to us and that wisdom, if we live our life in such a way, why wouldn't it be a glory, right? And ultimately, yes, the glory of this vessel goes back to him. I don't know there's just something so pretty about saying like look god created it for you and and it's gonna be glory like i, I just think that's amazing okay let's move on to this mystery then this god's wisdom that was um hidden and now has come true um ephesians 1 4 through 11 um again this section is talking about the plan of god the mystery of god's plan and, and ultimately how we fit in all right here we go for he chose us in him before the creation of the world, there's that phrase again, to be holy. Holy means to be set apart you know, for, for, with purpose and intent. Ah, there it is again. Didn't plan that. <laughs> um, a holy and blameless in his sight. Now we are blameless, not because we are perfect and hey, hey, look at me, but because he has made us so through the sacrifice and the cleansing of Jesus um okay so blameless in his sight in love so pretty so loving um he pre he predestined us for adoption to sonship okay these are big words okay he being god right he chose us from the before creation he knew us in his foreknowledge right um to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love, right? There's, there's this, it's not just like, oh, they're my little toys. It's, there's this love for humanity. He predestined us, right? Here, it doesn't mean that like, okay, only those who were predestined, everybody else ends up, you know, just, they're lost. No, um, he predestined a plan. And you, in your freedom of will, choose, he knows what choice you're going to make, but it doesn't take away the fact that you chose it, whether or not you want to be in that plan. So let's say you choose not to, right? That plan was still predestined. Like 
this is the way it's going to play out, right? Here's the boat, the cruise ship that's going on the ocean. You choose whether or not you buy a ticket kind of thing. Um, predestination has thrown so many people off here. Let's just keep it simple. He pre-planned something. And that plan was for us to be adopted into sonship, basically to be part of a family, right? Through Jesus Christ. You got faith in Christ that allows you to buy that ticket into the family or to be adopted officially into the family, right? Um, in accordance to his pleasure and will. He's God, he does what he wants. Six, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Talking about Jesus. He has given us this privilege through him, through Jesus, through the one he loves being Jesus. Seven, in him we have redemption, right? We have been redeemed. We have been bought back from the horrible pits that we found ourselves just lost. Um, in him we have been redeemed through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us right there's that forgiveness redemption um and, and it's all his grace and he just pours it on us that's what that's saying with all wisdom and understanding right he he knows all he knows how to work that knowledge he knows how to put it into action and he understands it with all wisdom and knowledge he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure again it's because he wants to, which is, which he purposed in Christ. Okay. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. Okay, what's that? Which he purposed in Christ. Okay, so Christ. To be put into effect when the time reached their fulfillment. Okay, so what's happening then? What is being put into effect? What is this mystery? Dash. Mine, mine included a dash doesn't have a dash in the Hebrew, to bring unity, here it is, this is the mystery, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Wait, what? That, that, that was it? That was it, guys. The mystery was that, mystery revealed, was not the fact that he chose Israelites and they were special people, and it was just them. No, the mystery was that they were part of a bigger plan that in God's wisdom and full understanding set into motion so that all things, right? And the beauty thing, beautiful thing is here, it's not just humans, all things. When Adam and Eve were cursed, the earth was cursed. The human processes were cursed. Interactions were cursed. All of creation received a curse. And now he's saying this, we're coming for a full circle. And the ultimate plan was to bring all things in unity, heaven and earth, under Christ. We were created, right? We were, verse 11, just finish it off. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan. There's that plan predestination there of him who works out everything in conformity to his purpose to the purpose of his will right his will for our redemption right our buying us back of our sanctification right making us holy and special to him our adoption right into this family of god um the the plan that included the sacrifice of jesus right so that he laid down his life for our forgiveness is ultimately to bring everything together under the authority of Christ. And that includes you and me, as it said in verse 11, in him, we were also chosen. And so when we talk about purpose, if, if the word of God is telling me that his wisdom and infinite understanding brought everything together into a plan where everything was to come under the reign of, of a loving Christ, of Jesus, then my purpose must also fall in that ultimate plan, right? Like it, it only goes to logically set that up. That's, that's the story here that's being played out. And so the gospel 
is the coming. Uh, it's not just the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the coming of a new kingdom in which God invites all of us to be partners and fellow workers with him as Christ reigns, right? Christ, Jesus, has become our the firstborn of this brotherhood. And in this, him being God, we repent of our self-important, self-serving ways, which is very, very human in a very, very fallen way. And we live a new kind of human, human that says, you're God, I'm your creation, and I live under you in joy and happiness because I'm living out the reason I was made. Like, isn't that what the world is looking for? What is the reason I was made? What am I, what do I exist for? What makes me come alive? God knows exactly those things. And he goes, recognize, <laughs> recognize that I am indeed the one who created you and I will give you the fulfillment of all those purposes. Ah, so good. Um, you were made by God and for God. And until you understand that, your life will never really make sense, right? It will never make sense. You know, there are people out there, oh, I found my purpose. And then, I don't know, let's say you're a football player. and This is what I live for. And woo, this is me. And then they break their leg. And this is no longer me. Now it has to change. And it goes from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. Um, it's not bad for us to have those goals and endeavors. What I'm saying, though, is when you really understand that we were made by God for God. And that, that, is, a, that is an eternal thing. It, it becomes something mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. I mean, think about this. I'm sorry. I feel like I have something <laughs> and I keep doing it. If you haven't noticed, go back and watch it. I keep, oh yeah. No, don't go back and watch it. Okay. Remember the first time that you ever saw a watch clock, right? And you're just like, uh, I don't know how to read that. I mean, there are adults that still don't know how to read a clock, right? But, okay, maybe you don't remember that moment. Have you ever lived through a moment where you show a kid a clock? Like, like I'm talking about like a little kid. I remember showing my nephew my watch, not this digital thing, but um, an actual, oh, look at that. <laughs> not that. An actual watch. And I remember him looking at it and just like, and I put it up to his ear, and he was like, <gasps> like it's making noises. But he looks at it, and he has no idea what it's for. And he won't know what it's for or how to read it until someone takes the time, probably his kindergarten or first grade teacher, um, or, or the rest of his life, because he just will never properly learn how to read a clock like I don't. I mean, I do, but like, okay, I'm digressing. <laughs> He will never properly know how to read it and use it for the purpose it was created until someone explains that to him, right? This is why there's 12 numbers. And this is why um, there's a big hand and a little hand and the little hand says something different than the big hand. And for those more complicated watches, you know, these little numbers here tell the thermometer, is the thermometer for the temperature of the it. Now, nowadays, watches need more instructors, manual than anything, but that's where I'm going with this. Without the manual or someone explaining it to you, that watch just wouldn't make sense, as is our lives. The Bible, God's word to us, is our owner's manual. It explains why we are alive, how life works, what to avoid, um, what to expect in the future. I mean, it even goes that far. Um, so. Let me just ask you to close this out. When was the last time that you opened your Bible and you didn't just read it because, okay, I'm going to do five minutes on the clock, or um, you didn't just read it because oh, my mom won't let me, I don't know, do whatever I need to do until I get my Bible reading. It, it's, it's more than a, a chore, right? Where you read it and then you asked God, like, like the living word that it is and God being the God who he is. Okay, God, teach me what I should do, what I should know. Show me how to live. Let me in on this plan that you have for my life. It's never going to read, Beverly, you are meant to be Blake, you know? 
most of us are still figuring those things out. But what we went through today is the beginning of that beautiful plan. And there's so much more details that I can possibly not have time to explain to you in, in a short little session like this, but sit with your Bible and, and, and do that. <laughs> and you'll see how God honors that request and shows you and opens your eyes to new worlds in front of you that you did not know were there for you. New understandings, new godly wisdom, right? Um, and then as you go through life, beware that there are a million voices speaking to you. You should do this, you should do this, you should, you should think like this, right? Um, and if you think any different, you're either an idiot or malinformed or old school or you name it, right? I mean, with the media pushing us this way and that, if you're not saying anything, you, you're you for it. Or if you're not, you know, angry, you should be. <laughs> it's like, stop telling me what to do. Um, <laughs> so it's frustrating. Um, with all these voices, how is it that you can remind yourself, right? Think of this now. How can you remind yourself in the midst of all these voices? that life is really about living for God and not for yourself. You go through life that way and you will be able to find peace in God, right? For the, what was it? For the mind that is on the spirit is peace. And I can memorize this. It's here, hold on. But the thing can be really, oh, the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. And I mean, ultimately that's what we want. We want life, who doesn't? We want to be alive uh, and we want to have peace. So I leave you with that. God bless you and I will see you guys next time.